Hi, and welcome to my presentation on Chapter 3, Protein Structure and Function. So within a cell, of course, you have a lot of different molecules. Some of them are small and some of them are big. The ones that are really, really big we call macromolecules. And there's four basic types of macromolecules that you can find in any cell. First, you have proteins, then carbohydrates, fats, and nucleic acids. Nucleic acids being DNA and RNA. So we've already kind of mentioned um, a couple of these, at least the nucleic acids, uh, the DNA and the RNA, and the proteins. Um, we're going to end up going through each of these macromolecules in turn uh, during this next portion of the semester, starting with proteins, then we'll go to nucleic acids, uh, then carbohydrates, and finally finishing with fats. Um, so the role of proteins in the cell is, well, pretty extensive, pretty extensive roles, I guess. Um, first off, proteins form a lot of the structures in the cell. Uh, not all of the structures, but a, a good number of them. And also proteins do work in the cell. Most of the work that is done in the cell is carried out by proteins. Uh, there's just a couple of examples of important work that gets done by another type of macromolecule. Uh, but for the most part, any time that a chemical reaction is occurring in the cell, um, it's a protein that's responsible for making sure that reaction goes forward. Uh, proteins are coded for by genes. So on a chromosome, which is a large molecule of DNA, uh, you have that information, that genetic information, divided up into genes. Every gene is going to code for one protein, which means that every gene has the instructions that you need to follow to build one protein. There's a couple of exceptions. There's some genes that have instructions to build RNA instead of proteins, but almost all genes um, are, are you know, intended to build a protein. Every protein, uh, for sure, has one gene that has the instructions on how to build that protein. That kind of process of using a gene to build a protein is what we call gene expression. Um, in that process, first you, you of course, are starting with your, your gene, uh, which is in the form of DNA. Um, then you're going to have some proteins actually come along and convert that information in the gene into mRNA. So they're going to build a molecule of mRNA based on the gene. Um, then that mRNA molecule is going to be transported outside of the nucleus by more proteins. Uh, once it's outside the nucleus, uh, it's going to be found by a giant protein complex called the ribosome, which will read the mRNA uh, and build a protein based on the instructions in the mRNA, which were copied ultimately from the gene. Um, that ribosome contains a lot of different proteins in it. It actually also contains some RNA as well that is doing some work in the ribosome. Uh, so the ribosome is one of the main examples of um, kind of work that gets done that's not done by protein uh, since you have RNA in there that's doing work as well. And then your diagram here is just kind of summarizing that process of gene expression. Uh, using a gene to build a protein. So you start with your DNA in the nucleus, uh, you copy that into mRNA, it would be proteins doing that work. That mRNA is transported out of the nucleus by more proteins. It gets caught up by this giant complex of proteins and RNA called the ribosome. The ribosome reads the mRNA um, and uses, it, uses that information to build the protein. So we'll go through the structure of proteins, starting with their building blocks, which are the amino acids. And we kind of briefly went over uh, the structure of amino acids in the last chapter, but we'll just go over it again here. Um, so to make a protein, you need to get a bunch of these amino acids together and link them together to make a chain. And then you would fold that chain up to make a complicated 3D shape. And then you have uh, an actual functional protein. Um, so we've got 20 different amino acids that cells will use to build their proteins. It's going to be uh, in the chain of amino acids that forms the protein, different sequences you know, of the different amino acids. Um, so different proteins will have a different sequence of those two or of those 20 amino acids uh, making them up. Um, if we look at the amino acids themselves, we can divide them into two basic parts. First, the backbone and then the side chain. In the backbone, you have uh, an amino group and a carboxyl group and an alpha carbon in the middle attaching them to each other. Um, so this diagram here is kind of showing you that. 
Uh, this R here is representing the side chain. The side chain is actually going to be different for all amino acids, for all 20. Each one has a unique side chain. And what they have in common is the backbone. So all 20 amino acids all have the exact same backbone structure. And it's these backbones that are linked together to make the chain. Then you would have the side chain just kind of sticking off. Um, so within this backbone, we have the amino group over here on the, uh, uh, the left. <laughs> and then we have the carboxyl group over on the right. In the middle, linking them together, you have the alpha carbon. Uh, attached to the alpha carbon, you have, of course, the amino group and the carboxyl group, but you also have a hydrogen atom and you have the side chain represented by R. So this alpha carbon is kind of forming the center of the amino acid in a way. Um, it's the center of the backbone and then it has the side chain coming off of it. And as you may remember from the last chapter, um, the amino group is basic and the carboxyl group is acidic. So that means that an amino acid has a, base, a basic part of its backbone and it also has an acidic part of its backbone. So if you put it into water, um, it's going to be picking up charges, gaining and losing protons. So in water, the basic part of the amino acid backbone, which is the amino group, is going to pick up a proton, um, which means that it's going to gain a positive charge. Then the carboxyl group, which is the acidic part, uh, is going to lose a proton, which means it's going to pick up a negative charge. Um, so you can see that in this diagram here. On top, you have the structure of an amino acid when it is not in water um, with the amino group and the carboxyl group in their kind of standard forms. But then if you add this amino acid to water, um, the basic part of it, which is the amino group, is going to gain a proton. So here you can see that extra proton ending up bonded to the nitrogen in the amino group uh, that has a positive charge. So the amino group will pick up a positive charge. At the same time, the carboxyl group will lose a proton. So this hydrogen attached to the oxygen in the carboxyl originally, um, actually you're going to split this hydrogen. The electron will remain behind and the proton part of it will leave. Uh, and that leaves you with just the electron, the extra electron on the oxygen, and that gives you a negative charge on the carboxyl group. Um, sometimes you might have the side chain that also has an acidic component or a basic component. So the side chain might be uh, charged in water as well, or it might not be. It just depends on the properties of the side chain. But the backbone will always be charged. It'll have one positive uh, side and one negative side. Those charges on the backbone end up being pretty, pretty important for proteins that are in water. And of course, any protein that is in a cell is going to be in water since the cell is mostly water. Um, the fact that the backbone is charged like that helps make sure that water molecules are able to interact with the backbone uh, so they can interact with the protein and that makes sure that the protein will stay uh, solubilized in the water. So it can actually be kind of dissolved in the water and mingle freely with the water rather than being excluded from the water. Um, it's also important because if the pH of the water starts to change, that can affect the charge on the proteins. Um, and when the, when the charges on those proteins start to change, that can potentially affect the function of the protein. So we'll just kind of briefly go over the different side chains that are possible on the, on the different amino acids. Um, this diagram here is showing all of the 20 amino acids with their side chains. Uh, so the side chain is always the highlighted part of the molecule. So you can see the backbone is on top, not highlighted. You have the amino group, uh, the central alpha carbon, the hydrogen atom attached to it, and then the carboxyl group. Um, you can see the carboxyl group and the amino group are shown as being charged because they are in water. And then you have the side chain coming off of that central alpha carbon. And you can see the side chain is different for each of these different amino acids. And we're grouping the side chains um, into different groups based on their chemical properties, uh, which I guess basically means that we're grouping the amino acids into different groups based on the chemical properties of their side chain. So you have three uh, basic groups that the uh, amino acids can be uh, categorized into. 
First you have charged, then you have polar, and then you have nonpolar. So the charged amino acids will all have a charge somewhere on their side chain. Of course, all the amino acids have charges in the backbone when they're in water, uh, but only the charged ones <laughs> or the ones in the charged group will uh, have a charge on the side chain somewhere. Um, so the side chains for the charged uh, amino acids can either be acidic or basic. If they're acidic, they're going to lose a proton in water and end up with a negative charge. If they're basic, they're going to gain a proton in water and end up with a positive charge. So you can see that here. Um, the acidic amino acids each have a negative charge in their side chain due to the carboxyl group that they have. And the positively charged um, amino acids or the basic ones uh, mostly have um, uh, amino groups that, that end up uh, picking up a proton. This one isn't a proper amino group, of course, but, um, but it did pick up a proton on a nitrogen. Then the polar amino acids are those that have a polar side chain, which means that they have uh, polar covalent bonds in their side chain and a basic asymmetry in the charge distribution uh, across the side chain. So for instance, on this one here, serine, it has a carbon with a couple hydrogens on it and it has a hydroxyl group. Uh, so there you have a bond between carbon and, hyd uh, sorry, carbon and oxygen. Oxygen is a lot more electronegative, so that's gonna be a polar covalent bond. So you end up having a partial negative charge on the oxygen and a partial positive charge on the carbon. <clears throat> and um, it's a basic asymmetry, so you have a negative side and kind of a positive side. Uh, so that makes it polar in terms of the side chain. Then on the bottom you have the nonpolar uh, amino acids. These are going to be amino acids that uh, basically do not have, um, they don't have uh, polar covalent bonds in the side chain. It's all just nonpolar covalent bonds. So you're seeing a lot of carbons in here, hydrogens, uh, some sulfurs. Sulfur has um, it has an electronegativity that is also kind of medium, so similar to carbon and hydrogen. So these are all uh, kind of nonpolar covalent bonds. The only exception in here would be this nitrogen. Uh, but I guess that's just not, that nitrogen on the tryptophan just isn't quite enough to alter the polarity of the whole <laughs> side chain. So you don't need to know kind of the, um, the individual amino acids. Uh, or their names or what their side chains look like. Uh, you just kind of need to know the three groups that they're grouped into and then you need to know which ones are hydrophilic or hydrophobic. Uh, so those groups again are charged, polar, and nonpolar. Uh, the charged ones have a charge on their side chain. The polar ones have polar covalent bonds in their side chain that make the side chain uh, polar. And the nonpolar ones have primarily, uh, almost exclusively, nonpolar covalent bonds. So they don't have any um, irregularities in the charge distribution. All the electrons are being equally shared. Um, so two of those groups are going to be hydrophilic and one of them is hydrophobic. And of course it's the charged and polar amino acids that are hydrophilic. Those have either a charge or a partial charge somewhere on the side chain that water is able to interact with. The nonpolar uh, amino acids are the ones that are hydrophobic. Uh, so water can still interact with the backbone there, but is not able to interact with the side chain. And that ends up having a significant effect on the structure and function of the uh, whole protein when you have a lot of nonpolar uh, side chains in the, in the amino acids. Um, there's only one amino acid that I will ask you to remember specifically, which is cysteine, and that's because it has the sulfhydryl group. So cysteine is here with the nonpolar amino acids, and you can see it has an SH on it, which is the sulfhydryl group. Um, so cysteine is the amino acid that is able to form disulfide bridges. You also have a uh, sulfur in this methionine, but that is not a sulfhydryl group, so it's not able to form the disulfide bridges. Only cysteine can form disulfide bridges because of its sulfhydryl group. Uh, so that's going to be uh, that's going to end up being pretty important for the uh, structure of the proteins that it's a part of. So in order to form a protein, you have to, of course, link amino acids together. Um, <clears throat> and the way to link them together is using something called a peptide bond. 
A peptide bond is a covalent bond between the carboxyl group on one amino acid and the amino group on another. Um, so if you have two amino acids, like are shown in this diagram at the bottom, um, here you have the carboxyl group on one of them and the amino group on another, and they're shown with the charges on them because they are in water. Um, when a peptide bond forms, you're going to end up linking this carbon to this nitrogen. So you're going to link the carboxyl carbon to the amino nitrogen. And in the process, this oxygen and hydrogen that are currently linked to, uh, to those atoms are going to depart. Um, so you end up having the carbon bonded to the nitrogen. And um, you actually end up also getting rid of this other hydrogen that's attached to the nitrogen. Uh, so you're getting rid of the oxygen on the carbon in, a carb in the carboxyl and uh, the two hydrogens on the amino group. Uh, those are all going to combine together to form water. Whenever we draw um, amino acids out like this in the chain that's linked kind of, you know, where they're linked together using the peptide bonds, we always draw it so that the first amino acid uh, is oriented with its amino group pointing towards the left. And then you have, um, you know, other amino acids attached to it, which means that at the end of the chain, the last amino acid is going to have its carboxyl group pointing out to the right. So on the left end of a chain of amino acids, you have the amino group of the first one. On the right end of a chain of amino acids, you have the carboxyl group of the last one. Um, so because of this convention of drawing it this way, we say that the, um, the amino groups uh, side is kind of the start and the carboxyl group side is kind of the end of the amino acid chain. So at the front of a chain of amino acids you have what's called the end terminus. This is just the place where you have the amino group at the front end and at the far end of the um, amino acid chain or at the back end, at the back end you have the C terminus which is the carboxyl group. So the N terminus would be the start and the uh, C terminus would be the end of the amino acid chain. Um, in order to convert this amino acid chain into an actual protein, you would then need to just fold it up the right way. Uh, a protein is only considered a protein when it's actually folded correctly. Um, and the amino acids themselves that are a part of this amino acid chain we don't actually call them, if we want to get technical, we don't call them amino acids anymore once they're, uh, once they're linked together by peptide bonds. Instead, we call them residues. Um, so in here, I'm just going to keep using the term amino acids because I feel like it's kind of simpler to just call an amino acid an, an amino acid, whether it's linked to another one or not. But uh, if you ever come across the word residues, that just means amino acids that are linked together in a chain by peptide bonds. So I said that we have a special name for amino acids when they're part of an amino acid chain. We call them residues. We also have special names for <laughs> different types of amino acid chains. Um, the smallest type of amino acid chain is called a peptide. Um, that would have 50 or less amino acids in it, or 50 or less residues, if we want to be technical. Um, sometimes a peptide actually is you know, considered functional, like has you know, a function <laughs> in the body. Um, usually they're not doing work the same way that a protein is, but they might be doing something like sending a message somewhere. Um, an example of that would be endorphins. So endorphins are signaling molecules in your brain that are released to kind of um, reduce your perception of pain. And those are actually uh, peptides in their structure. They're tiny, tiny little um, chains of amino acids. If you have a chain of amino acids that is longer than 50 uh, amino acids long, then that's called a polypeptide. Um, so it could be you know, up to any length, basically. It could be like thousands of amino acids long. That would be called a polypeptide. Um, then if you have a polypeptide like that and you fold it up and it takes on a function, then we call it a protein. So technically, um, after you have the, the protein built by the ribosome, you know, after the ribosome links the amino acids together to make a chain or a polypeptide, technically we still just call that a polypeptide. 
until that protein folds up into its final shape that it's going to have because the protein is always going to need to have its final shape in order to have its function. So a polypeptide is not functional. It doesn't have any function in the cell. Um, in order to have a function, it has to fold up and be a protein. So a lot of the time, I'm going to just say amino acid chain instead of polypeptide because I just feel like it's maybe more obvious what I'm talking about there, but um, you know the, the proper name for an amino acid chain that is long and is not folded up is a polypeptide. And the diagram here is showing you an example of an amino acid chain. This would be a peptide because it's quite short. Um, so you can see the backbone of all these different amino acids in the chain are linked together here. Uh, at the front end, you have the N terminus with the amino group of the front uh, amino acid. At the end, you have the C terminus with the carboxyl group of the last amino acid. Um, and then you have the amino acids linked together by peptide bonds between the carboxyl carbon of one and the amino nitrogen of the next. Um, and then you can see the side chains coming off of those backbones of each of the amino acids. So now that we've kind of talked about um, the basic linking of amino acids together to form a protein, we'll talk about the shape of proteins and how they fold up to make their shape. So every protein has its own unique 3D shape that it forms by folding up in a specific way. Um, and the shape is necessary for the function of the protein. So the shape is always going to be kind of complementary to the function of the protein. It will always support the function. So the figure here has examples of different proteins and how they're shaped. On the top you have the collagen protein, um, which is used for structural support it forms uh, things like your tendons um, and scar tissue, stuff like that. So uh, it forms into these long, kind of thick, thickish fibers that are really, really strong and hard to stretch. Um, so this shape complements its function of forming tendons and stuff. Uh, then down here you have a TATA binding protein. So this is a protein that is going to bind to DNA and help a, a protein be expressed or help a gene be expressed. It's going to bind to DNA at a particular gene and uh, it'll help make sure that that gene gets turned into mRNA so that a protein can be made from it. In order to bind DNA, it has this uh, groove in it that's here shown filled with DNA. So these red parts here are actually DNA that is wound into the TATA box uh, binding protein. Um, so it has a shape in it that is perfectly suited to fit this uh, little bit of DNA that it, it, that it is supposed to bind. Uh, then here you have a porin protein, which uh, would be allowing, it would be embedded in the membrane of a cell and it would be allowing water to cross through that membrane. Uh, so it has a little pore inside that is kind of just the right size and shape for water to go through. Um, and other things can't go through just water. Then on the end here, you have uh, chemotrypsin, which is a digestive enzyme. It helps you digest proteins that you eat. Uh, this purple thing is a protein that is currently being digested by this enzyme. So you can't exactly see it, uh, but up around here where this protein is attached to the chemotrypsin, uh, you would have a little, a little pocket that is perfectly shaped to fit this protein in and then to cut it. So all these different proteins have their own unique shape and it's all uh, or always related to the function of each of these proteins. Um, and the same would be true for any other protein that you might think of. Uh, the ways that protein folds up is kind of complicated. There's four different levels of structural organization that you find in proteins. Um, the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary levels are all about fold, folding. Uh, so I guess I should say those four levels are first primary, then secondary, then tertiary, and then quaternary. Um, the first level, the primary level, is just about the sequence of amino acids that you have in the chain. And then the last three, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary, are all about kind of how the protein folds up and comes together to make its final shape. So we will go through each of these levels in turn. So first we have the primary structure, which is just the sequence of amino acids in the amino acid chain that is forming that protein.
protein. Um, so just literally the order of the amino acids uh, in the protein. Uh, that's of course determined by the gene. So the gene has, uh, you know, bases in an order that will determine or kind of specify the order of amino acids that are going to go into the protein. When the ribosome is building the protein based on the mRNA, it's just reading the sequence of bases in the mRNA, and that is telling it which amino acid should go where in the amino acid chain that it is building. Um, all proteins will have their own unique primary structure. Some of them might have primary structures that are kind of close. Uh, usually those are going to end up also with uh, kind of a related shape and probably related function as well. Um, so even though primary structure isn't about like how the protein is actually folding up, it's just about the sequence of amino acids, it will end, uh, ultimately end up influencing how the protein does fold up. Um, and most importantly, it's going to influence like where different side chains are going to end up in the final folded structure. So you might have uh, some amino acids that are like nonpolar in their side chain, kind of scattered throughout the amino acid chain uh, of this protein. Um, and when you're folding them up, they might end up kind of next to each other to form a little pocket of nonpolar uh, side chains. Uh, but if those, if those amino acids were located at different positions in the primary structure, when it folds up, they might not all end up in that pocket. They might end up at different places. And that might affect the uh, behavior or function of the final uh, folded protein. So even though the primary structure doesn't um, isn't, isn't directly about the shape of the protein, it does influence the shape and it definitely influences the final function of the protein. So a good example of that would be um, found in a disease called sickle cell anemia, which you probably might have heard of. Um, in sickle cell anemia, you have a mutation to a gene for a subunit of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein that you have in your red blood cells that is actually carrying oxygen um, so, you know, those, those cells, those red blood cells, of course, carry oxygen around your body, and actually that oxygen is going to be bound onto these hemoglobin proteins. Um, a red blood cell is basically a little sac that is filled with these, uh, you know, copies of the hemoglobin protein, and they're all uh, attached to oxygen, and they're carrying oxygen around the body. Um, so normally that hemoglobin isn't going to be, it'll just be kind of floating in the red blood cell kind of sac, uh, but in sickle cell anemia, you have a mutation in one of the genes for the, for a hemoglobin subunit. Um, there's, so technically, if we want to get technical, hemoglobin has, uh, it's not just one protein, I guess, it's multiple smaller proteins that came together to make a big one, and we call each of those smaller proteins a subunit. Um, each of those subunits has its own gene. So you have a mutation in the gene for one of those subunits, which means that when you have those subunits come together to make the final protein, uh, they have kind of a different way that they're shaped or a different way that they're interacting depending or de determined by that mutation. Actually, that mutation kind of makes it so the hemoglobin proteins will stick to each other. Um, so this, this kind of image or figure is showing um, the mutation first. So here you have a little snippet of the amino acid chain or the primary structure for that subunit of the hemoglobin protein. And at the sixth position there, you have a glutamate in the uh, normal version of this protein. In the mutated version, that glutamate changes to a valine. So that's a mutation to the primary structure um, of this protein. Uh, when you have the normal version, you get a regular looking red blood cell. When you have the mutated version, you get this weird looking cell. Uh, so what's happening there is that all the hemoglobin proteins have stuck to each other and formed these kind of chains. And they're actually pushing the cell membrane into this strange shape. They're all kind of lined up together and pushing the cell into the sickle, sickle shape. So it doesn't, the whole cell actually ends up not being shaped like this, but rather like this, just because it has uh, long chains of hemoglobin proteins in there that normally should just be kind of floating around, not attached to each other. So when the hemoglobin protein is like this, making these long chains, uh, it's actually not quite as good at carrying oxygen, which is one problem, but another problem is just the shape of the cell itself. 
um, you know, this is this thing is kind of pointy at these ends here. So if you have a bunch of cells that are shaped like this in your blood, um, and you have these tiny little blood vessels, and they're trying to fit through there, they can end up kind of getting stuck, and they can end up kind of poking your blood vessels and causing damage to them. Um, and you know, it's very very painful actually. So that disease is caused by a single change in the primary structure of the hemoglobin protein. Uh, just, I guess, kind of illustrating how important primary structure can be for the final shape and behavior of a protein. So then we have the secondary structure. This is where the actual folding of the amino acid chain begins. In the secondary structure, you have really simple types of folding that can occur. Um, and there's two basic shapes that you can form this way. Either you can form an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. Uh, in this figure, the alpha helix is shown right here, and the beta pleated sheet is shown right here. So the amino acid chain here is in the helix is looped around to form the helix. In the beta pleated sheet, it's kind of zigzagging back and forth, and then it loops around and zigzags back the other way. Um, in each case, with either one of these shapes that you would form in the secondary structure, um, what is stabilizing the shape are hydrogen bonds between the backbone of of different amino acids in the chain. So all these kind of yellow dotted lines are the hydrogen bonds. And you can see they're being formed um, usually between the uh, oxygen on a, the double bonded oxygen of a carboxyl group of one amino acid back, uh, backbone uh, and the, um, the hydrogen that's left on that former amino group um, on another, on another uh, amino acid backbone. So if you look at this oxygen double bonded to the carbon, uh, the oxygen is going to be more electronegative than carbon, which means that these are polar covalent bonds, and the oxygen ends up with a partial negative charge, so it can do hydrogen bonding. Um, if you look over at this hydrogen, it's attached to a nitrogen. Nitrogen is a lot more electronegative than hydrogen is, so uh, again, this is also going to make a polar covalent bond in which the hydrogen is partially positively charged, and if they come close to each other, uh, this hydrogen and this oxygen, then they can form a hydrogen bond together. Uh, each one of those bonds, of course, is quite weak, but when you have a lot of them, you actually are able to hold a shape together in the protein and make it kind of fold a certain way. Um, so hydrogen bonds are pretty important for all aspects of the folding of a protein, but in the secondary structure where you're forming just one of these two uh, special shapes, the alpha helix or the beta pleated sheet, uh, the hydrogen bonding that is stabilizing that structure is only going to be between parts of the backbone of the amino acids. You're not going to have side chains participating in that at all. So only the backbone hydrogen bonding to itself is what's going to stabilize the secondary structure. Um, you do have an influence of the primary structure on the secondary structure, uh, and the biggest example of that would be proline. Proline is an amino acid with kind of a strange uh, shape in its side chain. Its side chain is right here. Uh, so it actually comes off the central alpha carbon, but then it loops back around and attaches to the amino group, to the nitrogen on the amino group in the backbone. Uh, so it forms kind of this, like, um, pentagon type shape, uh, which is really unusual. And that means that when you have proline in the primary structure, it is actually going to uh, force a kink into the amino acid chain and that would prevent an alpha helix from forming. So there's a few examples like that of ways that the that having a particular amino acid in, in a particular location can prevent you from forming, for instance, an alpha helix in that location. Uh, the next level of structural organization in proteins is the tertiary structure. So in, sim uh, in secondary structure, you have simple folding of the amino acid chain. In the tertiary structure, you have complex folding of the amino acid chain. Um, in the secondary structure, you're only going to make a couple of kind of stereotypical shapes. In the tertiary structure, you can make any shape. Um, so this is going to mean that if you have parts of the amino acid chain where you don't have any secondary structure present, there's no helices or sheets, those are going to fold up to form something in the tertiary structure. Uh, but also if you have parts of the chain that do have those alpha helices or the beta pleated sheets, those are going to fold up vis-a-vis -vis each other to form some type of shape. 
so you have a couple examples or a few examples of tertiary structure uh, in this diagram here. Here you have an example of uh, a protein that has four different alpha helices in its secondary structure. And in the tertiary structure, those alpha helices the alpha helices are folding up vis-a-vis -vis each other to make this uh, particular shape, which would be necessary for the function of this protein. In this protein, you have a couple of beta pleated sheets. There's one in front here, there's another one in the back, uh, and a couple of small alpha helices. And in the tertiary structure, uh, all those secondary structures have folded up to uh, to, I guess, form this particular arrangement with each other, where you have you know, one of those beta pleated sheets in the front, the other one is in the back, and the two alpha helices are on the top. And then on the bottom here, you have another, um, another example where this protein has a tiny little alpha helix right there, and it has a teensy weensy little beta pleated sheet right there. Uh, they have folded up to, uh, I guess, uh, to form this arrangement with each other. And then you also have um, some areas of that amino acid chain in the protein that don't have any secondary structure, and those have folded into a particular shape as well. So there's really no limit to the amount of shapes that you can make in the tertiary structure. Um, you know, it could be just basically anything. Um, the tertiary structure is always going to be stabilized by interactions between the side chains of the amino acids. Um, so the secondary structure is always stabilized by interactions or specifically hydrogen bonds between the backbones of the amino acids. The tertiary structure is going to be stabilized between interactions between the side chains. Occasionally you might see an interaction between uh, the backbone uh, of one amino acid and the side chain of another in uh, the tertiary structure, but usually it'll be side chains interacting with other side chains. And there's different types of interactions that they can have. First, you could have hydrogen bonding, of course, between uh, either between two side chains or maybe between the side chain of one and the backbone of another amino acid. Um, but in addition to that, you can have other interactions. So uh, if you have cysteines there, you could have cysteines forming disulfide bonds with each other, uh, actual covalent bonds. Um, you can also have ionic bonds uh, forming. If you get kind of uh, an acidic amino acid side chain next to a basic amino acid side chain, they might form a, an ionic bond with each other. Uh, and then finally, if you have nonpolar amino acid side chains that are close to together, you can have hydrophobic interactions occurring between them. So this figure on the top is kind of um, showing all those possible interactions that can stabilize the tertiary structure. So first you notice you have a couple of alpha helices in this uh, amino acid chain. So that's the secondary structure. And you can see the little yellow dotted lines that are the hydrogen bonds that are stabilizing those alpha helices. So that's the backbone hydrogen bonding with a, a, the backbone of another amino acid. Um, and then over here, you have different interactions that are stabilizing the actual tertiary structure, which would be this kind of ribbon-like um, shape that it has. So first, you have hydrogen bonds. At the top, you see a hydrogen bond between the side chain of one amino acid and the backbone of another amino acid. It's shown by this yellow dotted line again. Uh, down here, you have a, uh, a hydrogen bond that's formed between two side chains. Um, so in each case, these are going to be polar side chains uh, where you have a partially uh, positively charged hydrogen and a partially negatively charged oxygen or nitrogen on another amino acid side chain. Um, so polar, si polar side chains would be the ones that are forming these hydrogen bonds. Uh, then over here you have a disulfide bond that is formed between two cysteines uh, and their sulfhydryl groups. Um, and you end up with just a sulfur covalently bonded to another sulfur. Since this is a covalent bond, this is the strongest type of interaction you can have that might stabilize a tertiary structure um, in a protein. So uh, the hydrogen bonds are kind of weak, the hydrophobic interactions are very weak, the ionic, ionic bonds are reasonably strong, the disulfide bonds are really strong. Um, right, so that's a di disulfide bond. Then you have ionic bonds shown here. Um, so here you have an acidic uh, sorry, a basic side chain on this side. Uh, because it's basic, it tends to gain a protein. So when you put it in uh, a proton, sorry, when you put it in water, it's going to pick up a proton, which is why this amino group on it has a, a positive charge and an extra H. 
Um, and then that, that uh, amino acid side chain just happens to be right next to this other amino acid side chain, which is acidic, which means it's going to lose a proton in water. So it has lost a proton from its carboxyl group, leaving a negative charge on that oxygen. And then once that happens, now you have a negative charge right next to a positive charge, and those are going to attract each other and form the ionic bond. Uh, and then finally, here you have uh, hydrophobic interactions. So these two amino acid side chains um, are uh, nonpolar. Uh, they don't have any um, not they don't have any polar covalent bonds in them. Um, so they're going to interact with each other. <laughs> in this kind of special way that's called the hydrophobic interaction. It's almost not like a real interaction. It's almost more like they're just being frozen out by the water all around. So actually what you would have is water molecules all around here uh, that are all interacting with each other, interacting with the backbone of the protein, but they're not going to interact with these side chains because they're nonpolar. So since these side chains are surrounded by water molecules that are interacting with everything except for them, they kind of end up getting pushed together and they're kind of stable in that position when they're close together. Uh, there's not a reason for water to kind of come between them because there's nothing between them that water could interact with. Uh, so water's gonna stay out, interact with other stuff on the sides and that kind of forces these two uh, side chains together into this pocket. So as you might imagine, if you have an amino acid chain like this, um, that's just kind of forming this long ribbon, there's a lot of different ways that could fold up. Uh, there's a lot of different potential places where uh, amino acid side chains could hydrogen bond with each other or maybe form an ionic bond with each other, maybe even a disulfide bond with each other or hydrophobic interactions. Um, so there's a lot of different possibilities for how the protein could actually fold up in the tertiary structure. The cell has to make sure that it folds up the right way though. If it folds up the wrong way, <laughs> then the protein will not have the right shape and it won't do its function. So one of the big challenges that the cell has is to make sure that every protein folds the right way and ends up with the correct tertiary structure. And the cell has a few ways of doing that, which we're gonna kind of mention later on. The last uh, um, level of organization in protein structure is the quaternary structure. Now this level of organization actually does not apply to every single protein. So every single protein has a primary structure, a secondary structure, and a tertiary structure. But only some proteins have a quaternary structure. Not everyone does. In the quaternary structure, you have multiple subunits coming together to form a, a full functional protein. Um, so you're going to have multiple polypeptide chains or multiple amino acid chains that fold up in a particular way, right? So they each have their own kind of primary structure, secondary structure, and tertiary structure. And then we call those things subunits, and they're going to come together in a specific way to form a bigger protein. So the quaternary structure is just the way that those different subunits are coming together to form the full functional protein. So you have an example over here of the crow protein. Um, this protein has two different subunits. You can see that each of these subunits looks the same. So they're actually identical. Um, so you need to have the subunit basically produced twice and then two of them will come together in this specific arrangement to form the full functional protein. They have to be in this arrangement vis-a-vis -vis each other. So they have to be um, oriented so that the beta pleated sheets are kind of like next to each other like that. If you were to flip them around so that it was the alpha helices that were in the middle, then the protein would not function. It has to be shaped like this to function. So that's the quaternary structure, the specific way that these subunits are coming together and are arranged vis-a-vis -vis each other. That is the quaternary structure. On the bottom here, you have hemoglobin. Hemoglobin actually has four subunits in it, uh, and they're of two different types. So on the top, you can see a couple of green subunits. Those are identical subunits. And on the bottom, you have a couple of blue subunits, which are also identical. So the ones on the top are called the alpha subunits. The ones on the bottom are called the beta subunits. Um, so you would have one gene that is for the alpha subunit and a different gene that is for the beta subunit. And you need to make two copies of the alpha subunit and two copies of the beta subunit before you can make one full functional hemoglobin protein. Then if you have um, that single mutation uh, in one of these subunits, or actually it would be in two of them technically, then you're gonna end up with sickle cell anemia. 
the quaternary structure is stabilized by interactions that are really, uh, really similar to the ones that stabilize the tertiary structure. But instead of it being interactions between side chains of amino acids that are part of the same chain, it's going to be interactions between the side chains of amino acids that are on different subunits. So for here, for this crow protein, um, you're going to have interactions between the side chains on these amino acids for the first subunit and the side chains of the uh, amino acids on the second subunit. It can be, again, hydrogen bonding, uh, could be ionic bonds, in some cases might be disulfide bonds or disulfide bridges, um, and finally it might be hydrophobic interactions as well. So it's going to be the same types of interactions that you find stabilizing in the tertiary structure, it's just that um, it's going to be between the two different subunits. Um, so proteins that have multiple subunits uh, we call them, you know, just proteins <laughs> that have a quaternary structure. But sometimes you actually have kind of a larger structure that forms from multiple proteins. And we call that a protein complex. So a protein complex is going to have multiple proteins um, that are all coming together, attaching to each other in a certain way, and working together to carry out some larger task. If you look at those individual proteins in the protein complex, each one um, might just be a single protein or it might actually have its own subunits. So some of those proteins might have a quaternary structure as well. Some of them might just have, uh, you know, the one through the first three structure, uh, structural levels. Um, so the main difference between the protein complex and just a regular protein that has a quaternary structure, so it has subunits, is going to be just the size. A protein complex is going to be really big. Um, just a protein that has a quaternary structure will be less big. Also in a protein complex, you might have uh, multiple multiple macromolecules in there, so it might not just be proteins. A good example of that is the ribosome. Uh, that is uh, considered a protein complex. It's you know mostly made out of different proteins. Some of those proteins have their own subunits as well, uh, but it also has RNA in it, and the RNA is really crucial for its function. So just to kind of summarize the levels of structural organization in proteins, you start with the primary structure, which is the sequence of amino acids in the protein. This is what's actually assembled by the ribosome. And after that, you get folding and kind of the introduction of shape. So first you have the secondary structure or simple folding. Uh, you can make two shapes there, either the alpha helix or the beta pleated sheet. In either case, those shapes are stabilized by hydrogen bonding uh, between the backbones of the amino acids. Um, then after you have the secondary structure formed, you would form the tertiary structure in which the whole thing um, kind of folds up to make a complex 3D shape that is unique for every protein. Um, and then that tertiary structure is going to be stabilized by a bunch of different interactions between the side chains of the amino acids. Uh, so that could be uh, hydrogen bonds between them, um, could be ionic bonds, could be disulfide bonds or disulfide bridges. Uh, if you have cysteines in there, and it could be hydrophobic interactions as well. Um, uh, amino acids that have polar side chains can, can hydrogen bond with each other. Amino acids that um, are charged, so acidic and basic, can form ionic bonds with each other. Amino acids that are nonpolar in their side chains can form hydrophobic interactions with each other. And of course, cysteine can uh, form a disulfide bond with another cysteine. Then for some proteins, you're going to go on to the quaternary structure. So every protein has the primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. Only some will go on to have a quaternary structure. In the quaternary structure, you have multiple subunits, which would basically be like small amino acid chains that fold it up um, you know, and have their own tertiary structure. And they've come together in the specific arrangement to make the final full functional protein. Um, so just the arrangement of these subunits is the quaternary structure. And it's going to be stabilized using the same types of interactions that you see stabilizing the tertiary structure, except that uh, those interactions would be between amino acids that are on different subunits. So we'll finish up by just talking a little bit more about how folding occurs in proteins and some things that can go wrong with it. Um, so once you have a protein that is formed by the ribosome, and we're technically not calling it a protein yet, technically it's called 
a polypeptide because um, it's not folded yet and it doesn't have its final shape and its final function. Uh, once you get that protein, uh, <laughs> that not yet protein, that amino acid chain caught off the ribosome, um, if you just wait, it'll fold. But <laughs> the kind of caveat is that it might take a really long time for it to fold and it might not fold the right way. Um, and you really need to, to make sure that it folds the right way so that it will have the right function. And you kind of want it to fold quickly as well, because if you're just waiting there forever for your proteins to fold, then, you know, you're not able to use them in the meantime. And you probably made that protein because you need it. So cells need to make sure that this folding happens a lot quicker and that it happens the right way. They're going to use uh, molecules called molecular, uh, molecular chaperones to do that. Um, the molecular chaperone is usually a protein itself. Um, the molecular chaperone isn't exactly going to kind of like make the protein fold right. Uh, it definitely makes it fold faster, but rather than making it fold the right way, it kind of just like prevents it from folding the wrong way. And then the only way that's left is the right way. So it kind of just blocks all the wrong avenues. And the only choice that the protein has left is to fold uh, you know, the right way. And it, of course, it just makes sure that it goes a lot faster. Um, an example of a molecular chaperone, probably the one that is the most kind of famous, is the heat shock protein. So you probably haven't heard of heat shock proteins, but if you continue in biology classes and you take more like molecular biology classes, then you're going to be hearing about some heat shock proteins for sure. Um, Heat shock proteins are produced by cells, particularly like bacterial cells, in response to heat, basically. So if you expose those cells to heat, then you notice that they start making the heat shock proteins. That's actually why they're called heat shock proteins, just because we notice that when you shock the cells using heat, they start making these proteins. What those proteins are actually doing is making sure that the proteins, the other proteins in the cell, don't end up folding wrong because of the high heat. So temperature is going to affect how proteins are folding and how they're shaped. Um, if the temperature isn't right, they can end up being folded the wrong way. Uh, and the cell will make these molecular uh, chaperone heat shock proteins just to make sure that even though the temperature is too high, the proteins can still fold the right way and function correctly. It just um, you know, lets the cell like not die quite as fast <laughs> from, from being at too high of a temperature. Once you have a protein folded, uh, usually it's going to stay that way um, unless something bad happens in terms of the conditions that it's exposed to. Uh, so it is possible for folded proteins to unfold if they're exposed to adverse conditions like really high heat or really, or really weird pH, really extreme pH, or certain chemicals. Um, and once the protein is unfolded, we say that it is denatured. Uh, so a denatured protein is just a protein that is not folded anymore. It has lost its folds. Um, whenever the protein is losing its folding, so it's denaturing, uh, it's actually becoming non-functional as well. So a denatured protein is always going to be non-functional. Um, a few proteins, once they've denatured, uh, they can actually just refold once, once conditions go back to normal. So if you have like a protein that denatured because of really high heat, and then the temperature goes back to normal, um, sometimes that protein might be able to just fold back up the right way again, and then it'll function correctly again, everything will be fine. But actually, a lot of proteins cannot do that. <laughs> so for a lot of proteins, once they are denatured, kind of that's it for them, and the cell has to just destroy it and make a new protein, you know, if the cell's even still alive. <laughs> So on the top here, you can see, um, I guess, a representation of denaturation. So you're starting with a folded protein. It has the right shape. It has a function. Everything's groovy. Then something bad happens. Um, you know, maybe the solution becomes way too acidic, or maybe the temperature gets really, really high, um, and then it's going to denature. And it loses all of its folds, and you end up with just the amino acid chain, or technically just the polypeptide. Um, so you're, you're losing the tertiary structure and the secondary structure. Uh, this particular protein didn't have subunits, so it didn't have a quaternary structure. But if it did have subunits and a quaternary structure, then, you know, it would have lost that as well. Um, this is not functional. You know, there's no way for it to function.
And then on the bottom here, you have a representation of kind of how molecular chaperones are operating uh, and just kind of the options for proteins once they're made. So we're starting over here with protein synthesis. So this is, you know, basically a ribosome making a protein or making an amino acid chain. And it's going to produce this unfolded squiggly little amino acid chain. So this is not technically called a protein yet because it's not folded and it doesn't have, you know, a function since it's not folded. You need to make sure that this thing folds up. Uh, if you just wait, eventually it'll fold up, hopefully the right way, uh, into its final functional actual protein form, and then you can use it. But if you wait and it doesn't fold fast enough, it might end up forming an aggregate as more and more of these proteins are made, if they all just kind of stick around and they're not folded and they're just waiting forever to fold, uh, they might end up actually kind of sticking together and forming what we call an aggregate, which is just a mass of these unfolded proteins. Um, and you know, it's, it's not a good thing uh, for the cell to have. So if it's a small aggregate, the cell can just kind of break it up and recycle those uh, amino acids that are in the proteins. But if that doesn't happen and the aggregate just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, eventually it's going to be kind of, you know, too big and the cell will die. Um, so it's important to prevent that from happening. Um, in order to make sure that doesn't happen, you kind of want to make sure your proteins are folding up quickly. Also, so that, you know, so you could just go ahead and use them <laughs> because you only made it because you need it. You need to use it. You need it to work. So you have to fold it. Got to fold it fast. Um, so the normal fate for this protein that is unfolded uh, is for it to go to a chaperone. And a chaperone is going to come and find it and pick it up and cradle it and make sure that it folds real fast and in the right way. Um, and it does that by making sure that it actually blocks all of the kind of ways that it could fold the wrong way. So instead of forcing it to fold right, it's kind of, gonna, kind of just going to stop it from folding wrong and it'll end up having no choice but to fold right. Oh, that sounds like it was forced, huh? Well, <laughs> not directly at least, indirectly forced. Uh, then your final folded protein that actually has a function can go on and, you know, do that function. So next we'll talk about conformational changes. So I already kind of went over that proteins need to be shaped the right way in order to function the right way. So they have to fold right in order to work right. Um, but that's not the end of the story for some proteins. A lot of proteins actually need to be able to change their shape uh, once they're folded so that they can do their function. That slight change in the shape is called a conformational change. So this is not like the protein unfolding or anything like that. It is still folded up, uh, but it's just altered its shape a little bit um, and it can alter it back. Uh, and that's just necessary for the function that it has in the cell. So that's a conformational change. A slight change in shape for, of a protein for its function is a conformational change. An example is bacterial phytochrome. Uh, so this is a protein called phytochrome uh, that is found in bacteria. So it's like a special version of phytochrome called bacterial phytochrome because we find it in bacteria. Um, the job that it does is to sense light levels um, so that bacteria can kind of respond to light. So this would be for bacteria that are kind of living in maybe the water, uh, depending on how deep they are in the water, there might be more light or less light that's reaching them. They need to know how much light is getting down to them uh, because if they're in an environment that has a lot of light, they are gonna need to produce some molecules that can protect them from that light because the light can damage them. So those are gonna be antioxidants that protect them from the light. So whenever the bacteria go into the light, they need to make sure that they start making antioxidants um, so they can be protected from the light. Then if they go to an area that's kind of deeper in the water and there's not a lot of light there, now they don't need to make those antioxidants. And it would actually be better for them if they stopped making the antioxidants so that they're not kind of wasting energy making things they don't need. So um, the bacteria are going to use the bacterial phytochrome protein to let them know what the light levels are. And in order for that to work, the bacterial phytochrome protein has to undergo a conformational change. And that is actually what's shown uh, in these images here. So on the left, you have the bacterial phytochrome protein when it is at rest. So this is gonna be when there's no light um, in the environment, it'll have this particular shape. Uh, you notice that on the sides here, it has a couple of small beta pleated sheets. 
um, then when you shine a light on this protein, it's going to undergo a conformational change. It doesn't unfold, but it just slightly changes its shape. So in red here, you have the particular amino acid on this protein that is able to absorb light. Um, and that makes it sensitive to light. So when light comes in and it hits this particular protein, um, which you have another, sorry, this particular amino acid, which you have another copy of on the, on the other side, um, then it's going to absorb that light and that will trigger the conformational change. In that conformational change, you have these beta pleated sheets turn into helic, uh, helices. So now they are alpha helices. And when they turn into alpha helices, that is going to kind of tug on the top of the protein and you end up having the two top parts of this protein spread open, kind of like leaves opening up. Um, so in the resting shape, you have beta pleated sheets here. In the active shape, light is absorbed. It converts these beta pleated sheets to alpha helices and that pulls the top of the protein open. So that is the conformational change that this protein undergoes. Whenever the protein assumes this shape, then the cell knows that light is around and it's gonna start making the antioxidants. Whenever the protein goes back to this shape because the light leaves, then the cell will know that there's no more light and it can stop making the antioxidants. So it's really common to have conformational changes in proteins. Um, any protein that's going to sense something or send a message or respond to something, it's always going to need to use conformational changes to do that. It needs to have kind of one shape for one thing and another shape for another thing. So one shape for sensing light, one shape for not sensing light, that type of thing. One shape for receiving a message, one shape for not having received that message. That's actually also going to include a lot of enzymes. Enzymes are proteins that will catalyze chemical reactions in the cell and make sure that they go faster. We're actually going to cover enzymes in the next chapter. Um, so there's a lot of enzymes that need to be working at some times and kind of not be working at other times. Whenever those enzymes are on, then you're going to have them catalyzing a chemical reaction. That chemical reaction will start going really fast and you're going to be you know, making a lot of whatever product that reaction is producing. So if you need to make that product, then you want to turn the enzyme on, but maybe sometimes you don't need to make that product. In that case, you would want to turn that enzyme off. Um, a good example would actually be the bacterial phytochrome and the antioxidants that it's going to produce or cause to be produced during, uh, you know, when light is active. So, you know, when the cell enters the light, uh, the protein undergoes a conformational change into its active shape. That's going to let the cell know that there's light around. Um, then what the cell is probably going to do is turn on an enzyme that is then going to make antioxidants. Um, so that means that that enzyme will undergo a conformational change to activate and start making the antioxidants. Then when the light goes away, the phytochrome protein will go back to its original shape. The cell will know that there's no more light and it needs to stop making the antioxidants. So it's going to do something to make that enzyme turn off. That enzyme is going to uh, undergo a conformational change to turn back off. And when it's off, now you're not making those antioxidants anymore. So the last thing that we'll talk about in this chapter are prions. A prion is a special type of misfolded protein. Um, it's not unfolded, it is misfolded. So it, it's not, you know, it has a shape but it's not the right shape. <laughs> um, and it's, it's a special, an extra special, not the right shape because this shape, this particular way for the protein to misfold is actually going to make other proteins around it that are the same type of protein misfold the same way. So um, if you have this as your normal protein, this is the way that it's supposed to be shaped. This is the way that it can function. Um, here is the misfolded version of it. Uh, and if you get this misfolded protein around the regular protein, this regular protein is going to fold up the same way as the misfolded protein. And that means that it's going to lose its function. Um, even worse than that, once you get a lot of these misfolded proteins together, they're going to kind of stick together and form aggregates. And those aggregates are just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until they're too big and the cell that, they can t that they're you know, inside of will just die. Um, so prions, the kind of the, there's actually a number of examples of prion proteins, um, but there's only one that is well studied in humans uh, and other mammals also actually, which is kind of the first one that was discovered as well. So it's actually just called the prion protein. 
uh, everybody has the prion protein um, all throughout their body actually, but most of it uh, is kind of in the brain. So it's most concentrated in the brain. The normal prion protein looks like this. And it does something. <laughs> we actually don't know exactly what it does, uh, but it does do something because, you know, you need it. <laughs> All mammals actually have it, so we know that it's, you know, doing something important. We just haven't figured out what that is yet. Um, but, you know, this is its normal shape. And then the, uh, the bad shape, uh, the prion protein shape, is this, or the... I guess I should say the, the infectious prion protein shape is this. So the normal protein prion protein shape is this, and the infectious shape is this. Um, if you get this infectious shaped protein around the normal shaped protein, they're all going to convert to the infectious shaped protein. Then they're going to stop doing their function, whatever that function may be. Uh, they're going to form aggregates that get bigger and bigger and bigger as your life goes on, and eventually they're going to start killing your brain cells. Um, so... When you kind of ingest these infectious prion proteins, if you are unlucky enough to ingest them, then uh, they're going to kind of migrate to your brain and start uh, transforming your regular functioning prion proteins into the infectious form. Um, and that process is just going to continue and continue and to continue. Uh, you're going to get aggregates of these uh, misfolded infectious prion proteins that are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and your neurons will eventually start to die. Um, when that happens to you, that ends up kind of leaving like, like almost like holes in your brain. Um, so here on the uh, left side, you have an image of brain tissue that is normal, healthy brain tissue. And on the right side, you have an image of brain tissue of somebody who is infected with one of these prion protein diseases. Um, and you can see the kind of the holes that are left behind in the brain. So because all of these diseases that are related to the prion protein leave these holes behind in the brain eventually, we call them transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, <laughs> which is a big, uh, you know, several big words, <laughs> um, but it's transmissible because, you know, you can transmit it from person to person or from animal to animal by ingesting the infectious prion protein. It's spongiform because it creates these holes in the brain and it looks like a sponge, form of sponge. Um, and it's an encephalopathy because it's a disease that infects the brain. So the, the, Opathy there means that it's a disease, and the encephalo uh, means that it's affecting the brain. So it's a transmissible disease that uh, makes your brain get wholly sort of like a sponge. Kind of the most famous one of those diseases is mad cow disease. Um, you know, so that's a version of the disease that affects cows, but, you know, if, if you ingest the meat of a cow that has the disease, then you can get it as well, and it'll affect you. Um, but there's also other versions of the disease. There's scrapie that affects sheep, and you can get it, um, and there's some other ones as well, actually. But all of them involve the same prion protein, um, and it's infectious misfolded shape. So I guess I forgot there's actually one more thing to talk about in this chapter, which is just a general overview of protein functions. This is the actual last thing. Um, so different proteins will have different functions. There's actually a lot of proteins that would have multiple functions, actually. Um, and they're really diverse functions that proteins can have. But we can kind of generally categorize them into uh, one of these six categories. Uh, so first you have catalysis. Catalysis means speeding up a chemical reaction, so you know, just so it goes faster, um, without participating in the reaction. So a catalyst is any chemical that makes a chemical reaction go faster, but is not actually a part of the reaction. So it's not a reactant, it's not a product, it's not being changed in the reaction at all. It's just making it go faster. If you have a protein that functions as a catalyst, that's called an enzyme. Uh, so enzymes are really, 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 really important in the body um, for making reactions go faster. Um, this, you know, all the functions that proteins do are important, of course, but this is definitely the most important one because the chemical reactions that we rely on for, you know, our life um, don't happen fast on their own. Uh, even the ones that will happen spontaneously without, like, extra energy being put in, they still take, like, a long time to go. 
in some cases, billions of years. So, you know, obviously you, you cannot wait for a billion years for the, chemi you know, the chemical reactions that you need to occur. They have to occur like, you know, in like less than a second, basically. You need to like fast. Um, enzymes will make sure that those reactions are going really, really fast. Um, and so you are producing the things you need to live, you know, you know as quickly as you need to use them. Um, in addition to catalysis, uh, some proteins will function in structure, so um, just forming the structure of different tissues um, or the structure of cells themselves. So, uh, for instance, you have collagen, that is a structural protein that you find in tendons and ligaments and, you know, the skin and actually a bunch of different tissues. Uh, it helps give those tissues strength and structure. Um, inside of cells, you also have a skeleton, basically. Um, Oh, by the way, you have collagen in your bones as well, helps make them strong. Um, and yeah, inside cells you have a skeleton called the cytoskeleton. <laughs> um, cyto just means cell, so cell skeleton, basically. Uh, that skeleton is itself made out of proteins. So the shape of every cell is going to be in large part determined by that skeleton that it has that's made out of those structural proteins. Um, proteins are also important for movement. In protein, uh, I should say, <laughs> in muscles, <laughs> um, muscle contraction is actually done by proteins. So if you don't have those proteins, then you're not going to be you're not going to be moving <laughs> with your muscles. Um, but not just that, on a cellular level as well, actually, uh, for bacteria, um, some of them aren't able to actually move, but the ones that can move are using proteins to do that. Um, and also, within a cell itself, you need to be able to transport different substances around the cell. Kind of like, you know, you make them in one place, but you need them in a different place, stuff like that. So you always need this ability to move things around in the cell. And it's going to be proteins that are doing that as well. Then you have signaling. Um, of course, cells need to talk to each other. If they're going to like work together, they're going to need to talk together. Um, and they're going to do that using proteins. Um, there are some other molecules that cells can also use to communicate with. It doesn't have to be proteins, but a lot of the time it is proteins that they're actually, you know, sending messages with. And, um, you know, part of communicating is sending a message, but the other part of it is getting the message, right? So, um, you know, you might use a protein to send a message. It might be a different molecule that's used to send a message. But all the time when you're receiving a message, that's using a protein. Uh, it would be a protein called a receptor. So for every message to be sent, there's going to be some receptor protein to receive that message. Uh, and then once the message is received, probably that, that protein is going to undergo a conformational change um, to kind of let the cell know we got the message, things are happening, or you know they need to happen. Um, then you have transport, which is kind of a little bit related to movement, but also a little bit different. Um, so... In cells, uh, you need to kind of like, you need to get energy into cells, you need to get nutrients into cells, um, and you also are gonna produce some waste products in the cells and you need to get them out. So that means that different substances need to cross the membrane of the cell. Nutrients going in, waste going out. Um, in order to do that, you're gonna need proteins. Some molecules are able to cross the cell membrane by themselves, but a lot of them cannot do that, and they're going to need a protein to help them go across. So that's really important for cells. Um, also, if you're looking at kind of the whole body, uh, your blood is, of course, important for transporting stuff around the body, especially oxygen uh, as a nutrient <clears throat> and carbon dioxide as a waste product. Those molecules are going to go uh, around the blood carried on proteins, especially oxygen, actually. Oxygen is carried in the blood almost exclusively on proteins, on the hemoglobin protein. Uh, for carbon dioxide, some of it goes on hemoglobin, some of it, you know, just kind of goes by itself. But um, there's actually a number of different substances that need to be carried around the blood on proteins, not just oxygen and carbon dioxide, but also some hormones as well. They have to have a protein, pick them up and take them around in the blood if they're actually going to get anywhere. And then finally, defense. Uh, proteins are really, really important in our immune system. Um, so we probably all know that antibodies are an important part of the immune system that defends us from, um, from pathogens. Um, and antibodies are a type of protein, so <laughs> uh, 
yeah, those are important for basically identifying any cell that's not part of your body, identifying it as a pathogen, and, and making sure that the other cells in the immune system can find that pathogen and destroy it. Uh, you have other proteins that are important in the immune system as well, not just antibodies, but antibodies are kind of the, well, definitely the most famous and, you know, kind of the most important as well, a little bit.